Hello everyone, my name is Preston Dennett and welcome to a new episode of UFOs and the Paranormal. Today's episode I call California UFO Landings and Humanoids, 12 True Cases. I love cases involving sightings, don't get me wrong, but I think it's humanoids and landing cases is where we get a lot more information about extraterrestrials and the UFO phenomena itself. And the, all the cases I'm presenting today are from California. I think that's significant because it shows that each location on this planet, almost without exception, does have a long history of encounters. And the cases I'm presenting today reach all the way back to the 1920s up to the 1980s. So we're talking decades of encounters. I had a lot of cases to choose from, but I wanted to choose cases that I think are unique in some way, or have high levels of credibility, multiple witnesses, physical evidence perhaps in the form of landing trace cases or animal reactions, and cases involving a wide variety of humanoids. And it's really amazing how many different types of humanoids there are. It's certainly not just greys. So what I'm basically going to be doing today is giving you a reading from various sections of my book, UFOs Over California, A True History of Extraterrestrial Encounters in the Golden State. And each of these cases provides another piece of the UFO puzzle. So I do have a lot of cases to present, so let's just get started. The first case I'd like to talk about today took place in Bakersfield, again, California. This is in Southern California, north of Los Angeles in the high deserts. And in fact, this is one of the first UFO landings in California that left actual physical evidence of its existence. These types of cases are really rare and are called landing trace cases. And this one occurred well before the modern age of UFOs. It occurred on October 18, 1927, when a school teacher by the name of Richard Swede was driving alone in the outskirts of Bakersfield when he had an experience that he actually kept secret for about 32 years. As he was driving along the highway, he suddenly observed a strange saucer-shaped object landed directly along the side of the road ahead of him. He was able to get a close look at the object as he sped closer to it. He said the object was metallic looking, bluish gray in color, and was quite large, about 60 feet in diameter, and had a row of round windows around the perimeter. Now when he got close, it suddenly emitted a very strange noise, which he described as, quote, whining, humming, wheezing, and swooshing. This object then rose steadily at an angle of 45 degrees and accelerated very quickly up into the sky. Now he did something very smart. He kept his eyes on the exact landing location and pulled over to investigate. And upon examination, he was amazed to see that the sand on the ground where the object had been was, quote, fused like glass crystals. This is pretty significant for a couple of reasons. One, it does represent actual physical evidence of something very strange here but it also shows how hot these objects truly are. And that's what happened here. This case was inve investigated by pioneering researcher Charles Bowen, who was one of the first to accept that there were actually humanoids on board these craft. The next case I'd like to talk about occurred in El Cajon. This occurred in December of 1957 to a gentleman by the name of Edmund Rucker, a resident of El Cajon. And this was an experience that was very memorable to him. As he later told investigators, he was awakened one evening by a loud roaring noise coming from outside his home. And looking outside, he was shocked to see a, quote, strange object landing right next to his home. So this does seem to be intentional contact. And as Edmund Rucker says, and I quote, its windows were lighted and I saw strange looking heads in there. And they were strange because as Edmund Rucker watched 
An opening appeared in this craft and four beings emerged. He said they appeared to have bulging eyes and large dome-like foreheads. They actually spoke to him, saying that their intentions were scientific and philanthropic. Unfortunately, there's not a whole lot of other information about this case, which is, was again reported on by researcher Charles Bowen. But yeah, it's definitely an interesting case, and there are many more where that came from. The next case I want to talk about occurred on April 14, 1964, to an anonymous truck driver who was driving at night outside the town of Chico. And he says he came upon a domed disc hovering about 1,000 feet above his truck, which immediately stalled. At this point, the truck driver reported a strong feeling of static electricity, causing his hair to stand on end. So this is a physiological effect where his body is actually affected in some way. This is apparently because of the magnetic fields surrounding these craft. But according to this anonymous truck driver, this domed disc then lowered to the ground and actually landed next to the road. He was absolutely amazed by this, and he exited his truck and did something I wouldn't advise most people to do. He approached this disc and actually reached out and touched the craft. And as he said, it felt warm to the touch and caused a small electrical-like shock. And the witness says he also heard what sounded like voices. This was reported on by UFO researcher Richard Haynes, PhD, and it's a good solid case of a UFO landing. And although he didn't see any humanoids, he did hear them. And the next case actually occurred only two weeks later, April 1964, not far away. This occurred in the desert town of Baker. The witnesses included Gloria Biggs, her husband and mother, all of whom observed a brown dome-shaped object landed along the highway ahead of them while they were driving. Now they lost sight of it due to the path of the road, but when they reached the site of the landing, this object was gone. They did get out to investigate, however, and they saw, quote, a depression in the ground where the object had been. So this is fairly standard for UFO landings. They do often leave traces of some kind. This case was investigated by Jacques Vallée, who became particularly interested in landing trace cases, UFO landings in general, and collected a catalog of several hundred such cases. And here's another one from Jacques Vallée. And this one actually involves humanoids as well. This occurred on March 31, 1966, at around 6 a.m. The ordeal began when two women were passing by a construction site outside of San Francisco. They both observed a strange vehicle parked in the lot, and they described it as, quote, a large object with a pulsating bluish light on top, an orange light below, windows, and an antenna. The witnesses were even more amazed by the fact that they could actually see silhouettes moving around inside the craft, gesturing. It was only seconds later this craft took off very quickly and accelerated out of sight. But it's another amazing case of a landed UFO with occupants. There's so many cases like these. Seems like there are a large number of UFOs sighted landing alongside highways and freeways. And that's what occurred on October 4, 1973, in Simi Valley to Simi Valley resident Gary Chopik. He was driving along the 118 Simi Valley Freeway when he saw a quote triangular object landed along the roadside. This object had a transparent bubble on top through which Gary could see a, quote, humanoid figure moving about inside. Suddenly, this figure seemed to actually notice Gary, and he scrambled out of sight, and seconds later, 
The bubble retracted into the triangular object. A strange mist enveloped the craft, and a moment later, it was gone. It's not clear if it darted out of sight or just sort of faded away. This was reported on by Kevin Randall and Russ Estes, who wrote about this case in their book, Faces of the Visitors. But it's an interesting case because this is a fairly busy highway. And also interesting is this area is where there was a lot of nuclear testing going on. So perhaps that is a factor here. And here's another case, which occurred about two months later in the same year. This was on December 14, 1973. This is many miles away, up in Northern California, in a city called Paso Robles. The main witnesses in this case are Platoon Sergeant Lance Mathias and Computer Programmer Mike Andrews. It was around 9.40 p.m. in the evening as they were driving through Paso Robles when they saw a, quote, amber-colored sphere hovering at about 800 feet above the highway. This was a weird object. They could see a black cone on the bottom of this sphere, which was emitting a bright red beam of light, which was causing itself a, quote, great disturbance in the field below. And I'll just let Lance Mathias describe this. As he says, the beam shot out, stopped, then shot again in intermittent spurts. When this was done, the cone was drawn into the sphere and a cloud of vapor became visible where the cone had been. After a few seconds, this object darted away. This is interesting because in a lot of these cases, we do see strange mists or fogs enveloping these craft, which again appears to be a byproduct perhaps of their engines. But at any rate, Lance Mathias and Mike Andrews did what a lot of witnesses do. They ran into the field and examined the area where this beam had hit the ground. They actually found a strange ring of crushed grass, and the ground itself appeared to actually glow, though after about 15 minutes, this glow faded. They then turned on their flashlights and re prepared to return to their car, and it turns out their encounter wasn't over yet because suddenly their flashlight beams lit up two six-foot humanoid figures in metallic suits. And as Lance Mathias says, the two were side by side. They startled me. I know I saw them. At this point, the humanoids waved their arms in a strange way, but Lance and uh, Mike were too frightened and they departed the area in a panic. But later, when shown pictures of the humanoids seen by Charles Hickson and Calvin Parker in Pascagoula, Mississippi, of, of that year, actually, Lance Mathias replied, That's it. They looked just like that. So this is a good case because these are pretty good witnesses. There's two witnesses. There's landing traces. They were very close to these humanoids. They got confirmation about what they looked like. And another thing I like about this case is that it was investigated by Leonard Stringfield, a highly respected researcher. And he wrote about this case in his book, Situation Red, the UFO Siege. Now here is a really dramatic case, which took place one year later in 1974 outside the city of Ramona. This is in, in Southern California, north of San Diego, and this is quite a dramatic case. The main witnesses are the Overfelt family, and they were drawn outside their home by a bright object that had swooped out of the sky and landed on a hill very close to their home. The object, they said, was the size of a small house it appeared to be perfectly round, and it was changing in color from red to white. And here's where it gets really interesting. While this apparent craft was on the hill, the horses in their house and the other animals started reacting quite strangely. The horses started bucking. The dog slammed around in his doghouse. The goats were jumping up and down. 
and their cat ran into the side of the house, stunning itself. So this is a very solid case of animal reactions, and clearly the animals could sense this object. And when this object continued to stay there for quite some time, one of the family members actually called local investigators. But the investigators instructed them to check for electromagnetic effects. And the witnesses then learned that the radio in their house wouldn't work at all, and the television screen showed strange blue spots and vertical bands. This is when the object was still there. The witnesses then obtained a compass and were amazed to see the needle of the compass oscillating rapidly back and forth between north and northeast, the direction of the object. So this is not only animal effects going on here, but electromagnetic effects. So the UFO investigators headed out to the scene, but after about 20 minutes of staying there, this UFO suddenly hovered and took off, and immediately several military jets appeared in hot pursuit. So somehow they must have known it was there. Uh, I think this is why the UFO probably took off. At any rate, as the UFO took off, the compass needle flew off of its glass pivot and actually lodged against the glass cover of the compass. The main investigator to this case, Eric Herr, calls this case, quote, a classic. And I agree. It's got a lot of evidence to it. And here's another case, which occurred just three years later, on March 6, 1977, in the town of Silmar. This is in the San Fernando Valley, a pretty heavily populated area. And the main witness in this case is a private security guard by the name of Douglas Crees. A lot of security guards uh, become UFO witnesses because obviously they're outside keeping guard. And Douglas Crees was at his station outside a factory in Silmar when he saw a, quote, reddish glowing light. It came from the east, flew over his head, and actually landed behind a nearby building. Douglas Crease was in, intrigued, and he went to investigate, and to his amazement, he observed a landed craft, and he said it was shaped like a, quote, tuna can with a high transparent dome. The object itself glowed a deep red and was emitting a low hum. So he continued to approach this object, and when he got to within about 300 feet, he could feel an intense heat coming from the object. Uh, this warned him away, so he retreated and called the Van Nuys police. The police told him they do not handle UFO reports, and referred him to Ann Druffel, who was then one of Southern California's leading UFO investigators. Uh, she did meet with the witness, Douglas Crease. Of course, by this time, the UFO had already taken off, but she interviewed him and ended up writing about his case along with D. Scott Rogo in their excellent book, The Tahunga Canyon Contacts. It's a really interesting case. And here's another very unusual case, which actually took place over a period of years, starting around 1977. And this occurred outside of the town of Calusa. Uh, the witnesses in this case were two brothers. Uh, they are anonymous. They are Native Americans from the Cortina tribe. And they lived in a small, isolated ranch house, which was quite remote. It had no water or any electricity. But this case came to the attention of investigators after these brothers told their neighbor that a, quote, strange plane kept landing in their fields. And it wasn't just an object, because they said a short humanoid figure would then exit and harass the two brothers. And as the brothers told their neighbor, this object showed up and then darted away quickly. One of the brothers, we do know his first name, Amos, told his neighbor that he disliked the visitations because the, quote, little stranger made all his horses go wild, and hunting the next day was difficult because all the animals would go into hiding. 
So this is another interesting example of animal reactions. And according to Amos, this figure didn't actually walk, but floated a few feet above the ground. He was quite short, only three and a half feet tall, and typically wore a strange one-piece brown uniform. His appearance was quite unusual. Uh, according to Amos, he had long hair, a large nose, and gave off a bad smell. Amos reports that this figure would actually enter through the walls of their cabin and then dart away whenever Amos approached. Now, when investigators arrived following um, several of these incidents, Amos showed them where the object had landed, and investigators did find strange circles of crushed and swirled grass. And during one visit on October 18, 1977, one of the investigators actually observed the UFO approach close up and then dart away. And when the investigators finally left, these visitations continued on afterwards. This is a case that was reported on in Jacques Vallée's catalog of UFO landings. And yeah, a very interesting and unusual case. Now here is a particularly compelling report, which comes from an anonymous couple, a man and a woman from Los Angeles. They were driving together on their motorcycle in the late afternoon. This is uh, around 1980 or so. And the couple said, well, I'll just quote the main witness. They were driving on their motorcycle in the late afternoon through downtown LA when their encounter occurred. And as the woman says, and I quote, I saw what appeared to be a metallic colored disc shaped object shoot up from behind the taller buildings nearby. It got to a height of 100 feet in the air. We turned left, and then the sun shined on it, and I could see inside because the ship turned transparent. I could see three or four people inside. Two were looking out at me and were leaning over a console or platform. They looked like two handsome, ordinary human men. I gave them a peace sign because it seemed a fun thing to do. They didn't respond, but showed no emotion other than curiosity. I don't tell many people because of my fear of ridicule, but my husband saw them too, but not as clearly as me. It reminded us of a soap bubble when the setting sun shone on it. Where the sun didn't hit it, the craft remained a steel gray opaque color. My husband doesn't think it's a good idea to tell anyone, but I've been keeping quiet for too long. They ended up reporting their case to New Fork, the National UFO Reporting Center. And this case is interesting because it involves this disc which turns transparent. And they saw human-looking ETs. <laughs> she gave them the peace sign. It's a very interesting case. And now I get to the last case I'd like to present today. And this occurred in Sherman Oaks, California. Uh, this is right up near Los Angeles. And the witness is Maria. We don't know her last name. This was reported on by Richard Haynes, again, a prominent UFO researcher. Maria was 42 years old, a divorced mother of two boys and she lived alone with her younger eight-year-old son. Her older son had moved out, actually, because Maria was experiencing repeated visitations by gray-type ETs. And it was around 2 a.m. in the morning of November 29, 1988, when Maria woke up once again to find an ET in her bedroom. And I'll just quote Maria directly, as she says, there was a being evidently assigned to keep me absolutely frozen to the spot. He seemed most unhappy with his task. He's, he was standing almost like a sentry. Now this upset Maria because her eight-year-old son was also in the room and each time she tried to open her eyes to see him, she said that this ET forced her to close them again. And after a long mental struggle, Maria kind of gave up and her next memory was waking up the next morning. 
and during breakfast she asked her son if he had had a good night's sleep. And he said, yes. And you know what? My aliens came back. So he was absolutely aware of what was going on. Like Maria, however, her son was unable to recall any on-board sequence. However, he did report something very interesting. And that's why I wanted to include this case. He vividly recounted to his mother how it felt to be taken through the closed front door. As he told his mother, and I quote, Well, you see, once you get halfway through it, it's not wood anymore. It's really neat. It changes into lots of little colored balls. And that's the most fun part. And the only time the aliens ever get mad at me is because I like to stay in the middle and look at the balls for a really long time. But they tell me it's dangerous to stay in the middle. I have to come out the other side. And as Maria, his mother, says, he was disappointed about that, but he was very emphatic. And then he went on to ask what was for lunch later, and he dropped the whole subject as if it was just as matter of fact as could be. Now Richard Haynes was the primary investigator to this case, and as he says, I worked with Maria over an 18-month period. She claimed to have had over 50 separate visits, one every 11 days on the average. And this event took place during the middle of this sequence. Those are the 12 cases that I wanted to present to you today. Again, all of them are from my book, UFOs Over California, A True History of Extraterrestrial Encounters in the Golden State. And as you can see, they are quite different in terms of what happens, how people react, the different types of ETs seen, the evidence involved with them. And I think these cases show what it's like to have face-to-face -face encounters with extraterrestrials or what it's like to have a UFO land right next to you. I love these cases because unlike sightings, there's virtually no chance of misperception. These encounters, as a rule, are very close encounters. And by that I mean just a few feet away. And as you can see, these encounters have affected the witnesses profoundly. I hope you've enjoyed today's show. I truly appreciate you watching. And until next time, keep searching for answers. Keep looking for the truth. And most important, keep having fun. Bye now.